Anders has been working on a book called Grand Futures, which I usually describe as the book to contain all books. There's chapters that cover entire scientific fields. Uh, and then he takes it all the way out there into like a long-term future uh, in the universe. What, what, what happens if we meet other uh, alien creatures? Um, uh, and, and what about space war, et cetera, PP? But uh, you should talk to us about it. It's a fantastic book, uh, still in draft form, but the draft's already quite long. How many pages? Uh, 1,400, give or take uh, a few. Uh, it, it recently shrunk a fair bit because I moved it to the other book I'm currently writing because I'm an idiot. Uh, but the other book is about AI, so it might be a bit more urgent. Uh, the funny thing is, of course, that when you write about the grand futures, yes, the, Uh, you can actually afford it to be a bit slow in writing because uh, the singularity happens somewhere in chapter five and uh, my basic uh, take on it is that I, if it happens while I'm writing, I just need to update that chapter and hopefully the rest of it stays the same. What I'm really afraid of is of course that we figure out what dark matter is and I have to redo the calculations of the later half of the book. But this is going to be This is a talk a little bit going into, I actually think it fits in rather nicely with all the previous talks, which is a wonderful coincidence. It's not at all planned, it's just serendipity. Um, basically, it started with me thinking about mega scale engineering. Uh, so the first really cool mega scale engineering project uh, was actually when a Jesuit sensor uh, in 1603 estimated what the machinery would be needed to lift the world. Basically, his jo uh, job was uh, to think about these new emerging technologies and what the church was supposed to be publishing about it. But he was basically, he would probably have been in the audience if he had been alive today because he was a nerd, exactly like us. He couldn't stay away from his wonderful new science. And he came up with this interesting question. What would it take to lift the world? And he essentially figured out uh, that if I gear so with one to 10 ratio of gearing, uh, I would need about 24 gears to lift the world using a thread mill. So you have somebody or a horse going there, and then you can lift the world very, very, very slowly. Um, He had to come up with an estimate of Earth's mass, which he felt for religious reasons was oh, probably one of the secret only God is allowed to do. But I'm allowed to do an order of magnitude estimation. What if Earth was made out of gold? That's unrealistic, but it gives me a number. And he basically comes up with something that most people would agree would work if you somehow could get these darn gears and if there was gravity in space. And indeed, like many physicists, he says that, yeah, and how to build these gears and where to place them, I leave as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> uh, but the point about this is that as long as we had had mechanics, uh, people have been very willing to take these formulas and apply them to much bigger things than we actually could do. The famous story about Archimedes and the lever is this recognition that, okay, if I have a fixed point and a lever long enough, you could lift the earth. That's a logical result of the math and the logic of the whole system. And it's kind of irresistible if you're a physicist. Newton started thinking about the uh, cannons, uh, throwing cannonballs uh, further and further away. And uh, that way you get an easy explanation of why you can have things orbiting planets, etc. It's a very powerful intuition part. The interesting thing is, of course, later on, Garibul actually tried to make an orbital gun to actually literally, physically and, and launch satellites. So from the scientific tendency, oh, what happens if I take my equations to the limit? You get the engineering perspective. Oh, maybe we could actually do it and it would be darn nifty. So another classic example of doing this is the orbital elevator. Uh, so this is again based on this thought experiment. You start with a station, a geostationary satellite. What if you lower a rope from it? Well, it's just going to hang down there. You might need a counterweight to balance the weight of a rope. Eventually it reaches Earth's surface. You have a very easy way of getting to space without reusable rockets. Yay! Until you calculate the tension in the rope and suddenly the numbers get very, very big except that they're almost on the order of what you could do with molecular nanotechnology. Uh, Eric has actually convinced me that this is not a good idea because it's so close for Earth to the limits that once a nanotube snaps, a lot of energy, elastic energy, gets moved to the side and turns into heat, hitting other molecules. And oh yes, there are space debris and there are lightning storms and a lot of reasons why this is not a great idea on Earth. 
But that has not stopped a lot of people from thinking carefully about it. Similarly, another idea is, of course, well, we could remodel the Earth. The, uh, in the American uh, the, the nuclear weapons program, Edward Teller wanted to demonstrate that hydrogen bombs were an answer to any con uh, conceivable question. So, of course, we should be able to use it for Earth moving or digging harbors and uh, generally make new canals really, really fast if you don't mind that they're slightly radioactive. So the Soviet Union had a counterpart, uh, but they actually didn't seem to do quite as much crazy stuff as Operation Plowshare did. As a side effect, however, it also led to thinking about Project Orion, actually using nuclear explosions for interplanetary and interstellar propulsion. And it's generally regarded as, yep, it's totally crazy. It also looks like it's maybe workable. It's not entirely implausible. But also the observation that you could do geothermal fusion. We actually could build fusion reactors by Put, uh, dumping uh, nuclear warheads into um, uh, the, the mine shafts in, in, in a, a salt bed, detonate them, and use standard geothermal energy in, uh, from that. This is not economical viable right now, but were energy prices 10 times higher, it would. And probably mass production of hydrogen bombs, would, uh, if you do it on large scale, would be cheap. It's kind of one of those just barely doable things. It's probably not something anybody will want to do, but it's still doable. Anyway, just riffing through other interesting old megascale engineering, Hermann Sörgler had this utopian vision of United Europe and Africa <laughs> by damming up uh, Gibraltar and then lowering, of course, uh, the water level because the one big problem in the world is lack of agri uh, agricultural land. Uh, then you add a few uh, bridges. I think he wanted an extra canal. You get the hydropower plant in the central uh, in, uh, in Istanbul. They're probably not going to complain about that. It was a lot of assumption that people are going to be very fine with a lot of this. And of course, from our current perspective, perspective we say, okay, this is an obvious ecological disaster. Still, it's not entirely uh, uh, different from how the Mediterranean was actually isolated from the Atlantic a few hundred thousand years ago, or actually a few million years ago, the Messinian salinity crisis. Look it up if you're interested. Uh, but again, it's interesting because this is, again, barely doable. It turns out to be stupid and impractical, especially for uh, the earthquake reasons. Another one, a similar project, which was most as a rhetorical little device, was the North European Enclosure Dam. So what if climate change continues? If you're in the Netherlands, this is bad. Oh, shit. Uh, OK, jumping ahead. Uh, geoengineering, terraforming, uh, life extension for the biosphere, building Dyson spheres, moving stars and galaxies, and settling uh, a big chunk of accessible universe. These are all very cool megascale engineering, and I think we can make a good argument that they are physically possible. Some of them might actually be good ideas, not all of them. Quite a lot of them are really bad ideas for various, but many of them I think are really good. But it's also interesting to observe that we have a lot of quite megascale engineering. We're actually living in a world that is already a kind of grand future. Uh, we have uh, countrysides that are lit up at night where we're converting nuclear or fossil fuel energy into food. Uh, we have created these artificial environments that are both weird, horrifying, wonderful. We created this uh, agricultural environment that cover large swaths of the earth over very long time. Some uh, agricultural and especially eel traps in Australia have been around for literally more than 10,000 years. And the really interesting thing here is that these things actually work and they have been built. There are some mega scale engineering like the ISS and the CERN that are very singular projects. These ones have been done on a large scale. Now, the interesting thing and the point I'm actually trying to get to here, besides the question of exploratory engineering, is that our experience with these vast projects is generally not great when we do mega scale projects, when we try to build a new highway. Cost overruns and delays, all that. But sometimes they work really well. The internet is a mega scale engineering that has, I think, actually ushered in a somewhat grand future. And typically they happen when they can be done piecemeal. You don't need to build that uh, orbital cable uh, all at once. Uh, but that's the problem because we need to build it all at once to make it work. The internet, you can set it up computer by computer. You can build one terrace after another. You can maintain them separately. It's, if one terrace breaks, if one server breaks, everything is fine. We just replace the server, we help our neighbor with the terrace. If uh, the orbital cable fails, uh-oh. 
The Dyson sphere is not a solid shell, it's a swarm. You can replace a part, but you still need to maintain it because you don't want to get a Kessler cascade in a Dyson sphere. That is very bad news. Uh, to finally just pass by, it's worth noting that we're a lame scale engineer. You can scale down some of our mega scale engineering things and actually do them usefully. We already have a tiny um, <laughs> Dyson sphere in the form of a few satellites in heliocentric orbits that are collecting energy for our use. Uh, it might be very hard to sequester the carbon dioxide of the South Pole, but we can make water glaciers easier. We can actually do shades for that. There is a lot of modest mega scale engineering we can use. Uh, and we can use that relatively early. So I think we need to go for a bit like the EA mantra, scale, tractability, and neglect this. We can do the same thing actually for thinking about mega scale engineering. They, they're, well, I'm, oh sorry, that's uh, just some game theory. Uh, okay, uh, even, uh, in, even Moloch thinks that I should end now. But yeah, just, I, I just want to say that the grand future is a gradual thing. It's not something we need to go as a kind of quantum leap, uh, uh, but actually we build it gradually and we can make it using small pieces to get to those grand results. Thank you. Can we get the full version of this talk? Yeah. Or simply say my name. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do uh, so, uh, so, okay, so full version. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the shortened is version. The shortened <laughs> version. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that uh, okay. and um, just generally discuss all of it because most of these things are worth a talk. I mean, what was Sergal thinking about? Uh, what, what about that dam for the North Sea? What, what was the real rhetorical point, really? And how do you actually handle eel traps over thousands of years when you can't communicate using written language? Barbara. Um, so, um, where does geoengineering sit on that scale for you? Uh, it's one of those things that are annoying because they're actually probably a bad idea, but relatively easy to do. Uh, because getting uh, aerosols up in the stratosphere, you just need uh, sufficiently big uh, cannons. Again, sea bulls, uh, giant cannons. And that, if you're a desperate low-lying country, you might be very tempted to do that. Uh, and that is probably not a good thing to do alone. This is where you actually would like to have global coordination. Uh, this is where we probably should be lobbying uh, that uh, if any geoengineering gets done, it needs to be approved by the, world, the chief of the World Meteorological uh, Organization or something like that. We actually probably want to have an official, the buck stops here, governance of that. But I think uh, the aerosols again, uh, the, to lower Earth's temperature is a little bit too doable. Uh, I think carbon capture and sequestration, which is probably a good kind of geoengineering in this case, that we need to work much harder on, and nanotechnology is likely to help a lot, but there are other more boring ways that we can do. Generally, technological fixes tend to work really well when we base them, when we base them on a, a standard technology that already exists that we can scale up or adapt. And actually, uh, that is doable for the carbon capture and storage. It just needs to be made economical. Uh, putting up solar shields, etc. I'm very fond of that. I have that in my paper about saving the biosphere in a billion years. I think that's a very crappy method right now for fixing our current little climate uh, problem. But once the sun starts to turn into a subgiant, we actually have a very good reason to do it. Awesome. Thank you, Anders. Thank you. Thank you.